Good afternoon. I, <coughs> well, and welcome to the, uh, the courthouse. Last time I was here, uh, it was for a speeding offence. And actually, I think I'm standing exactly where, the, uh, where I didn't want to end up, in the, uh, in the holding cell. But uh, I survived that, so I can survive anything. Nowadays, I, I'm so old I couldn't even speed if I wanted to. Um, when Neil Watson and Mark and I met to discuss some of the things we wanted to get across this morning, it began to look alarmingly as I was going to give one of Fidel Castro's speeches and that we'd actually have to supply dinner as well as lunch. But I think we managed to trim it down a bit. But I do apologise as I go in two things. I'm croaking, hence the strepsil in my mouth, and I'm not able to speak at anything like the speed of that young man. Um, so um, yeah, I'm gonna, I know for a couple of minutes now, having just heard that, I'm going to sound pretty ponderous, but uh, it'll get better. Um, I'm going to touch on some new FDA work not shown on that video in a few moments. But if I may, I'll begin by offering my warmest congratulations to those film distributors and publicists whose work we celebrated three weeks ago at the Screen Marketing and Distribution Trade Awards. And to step back a little, I'd like to congratulate and thank all those who managed to find time to actually fill in their entries, which were in themselves pretty onerous. In July this year, when the, headline, when the deadline entry fell, no fewer than 159 films had already played in UK cinemas, 54 of them new releases out that month. It's an astonishing reflection of a densely crowded marketplace. In today's world of superabundant content, film, distributi film distributors compete in the attention economy, and believe me, that is not a place for the faint-hearted. As the American writer James Gleick has put it, when information is cheap, attention becomes very expensive. Last year, as FDA president, I chaired the inaugural Screen Distribution Awards jury. But having been awarded when this year's voting took place, I found myself scanning the, the winners' portfolios with a, a mixture of frustration, admiration, even awe. I think it goes without saying, particularly from this podium, that the persuasive profiles delivered by distribution teams are fundamental to the success of the industry as a whole. Insofar as its future ultimately depends on the extent to which its product connects with the audience, the movie industry is not that much different from any other. But this autumn, I originally find itself at a kind of pivot point. That's to say, a fast approaching set of milestones and decisions that could very easily shape its destiny for years to come. So today I'm going to reflect on just a handful of factors underlying this situation, consider some of the priorities we need to address in the coming months. My overall theme is the timely one that I started with, recognising the values and the imperatives that lie behind audience motivation and engagement. Firstly, and most obviously, in terms of the transformation of cinemas, we've just sailed straight past one momentous tipping point. More than half of the UK cinema screens are now digital, and by the end of next year, the total conversion will be all but done and dusted. The digital systems, installed largely at distributors' own ongoing expense, are helping exhibitors to run more profitable businesses and to enjoy more flexible programming options than I think have ever been possible in the past. In return, distributors quite properly expect more flexibility regarding their own business plans. And this bears down on such matters as the dating of releases and free access to trailer spots. I'm well aware that detailed considerations of this type have been an aspect of bilateral negotiations for years and years, and rightly so. But if we're serious about optimising audiences, now and in the future, then they need to become more important than ever. This, I think, is the moment to start shaping the future and to get over our obsession with genuflecting towards what was always a pretty inconsistent past. Even the good years, you were always fearful to be followed by a couple of very bad ones. I think, to an extent, the last few years have begun to get a, a greater sense of certainty into the industry, and I, I welcome that. The eagerly awaited film policy review will hopefully take full account of industry-wide patterns of costs, risks and rewards when considering the best and the most sustainable way forward. And I'm very grateful, Chris, Chris Smith, for taking the time, trouble, effort and to uh, come here this morning and, and listen to me. Let's talk about the film policy review itself. This autumn is a crucial period when the review is now deeply into its huddle phase. Chris, a knowledgeable, trusted and rigorously independent chair, together with his eminent panel, is attempting to identify common strands from the stack of over 300 submissions that they received during the consultation phase, sifting them into new and hopefully imaginative interventions to recommend to the government. 
we all wish the BFI success as the lead agency for film. It's in everyone's interest that it's extremely successful. But we'd be foolish to underestimate the enormity of the paradigm shift that faces the BFI in the year, or maybe more precisely, the weeks and months ahead of it. Despite film culture and commerce being heavily intertwined, and I've never for a moment backed away from that belief, the BFI will have to give and be seen to have allocated as much weight to the needs of the industry and distribution specifically as to those cultural matters which up to now have quite understandably been at the very core of its DNA. I'll come on to a specific challenge for the lead agency in just a few moments. I have every pomp confidence that Chris Smith's report, when it's delivered in December, will offer a smart, well thought out and balanced blueprint focusing on the varying needs of a diverse audiences. We can then hope that the Minister Ed Vasey and his team at the DCMS will pick up on those recommendations and insist that they're implemented in very, very short order. It's crystal clear, to me at least, that over the next four to five years, as many of those policy recommendations run their course, the very nature of our digital film economy will have undergone significant shifts. Just think of the ways in which your own working lives have changed in the last five years, and then double or treble that as the pace of change multiplies. In this relatively early part of the 21st century, both industry and society are fast becoming less centralised, more networked and rather more fluid. Top talent is increasingly mobile. Audiences are ever more eager to form and share their own opinions. The shift from computers to computing, with more screens and fewer storage boxes, is well underway. Energy efficient, smart televisions are in the works and operable by Wi-Fi at the stroke of a smartphone. Indeed, this summer, or I should say this autumn, hasn't happened yet, John Lewis is selling an internet-enabled television with free copper-bottom guarantee for five years. Wouldn't it be great if Chris was able to offer a film policy review that could arrive with one of those? Governments can often be heard urging industries right across the board to adapt their current models to a so-called demand-driven digital environment, almost as though the thought had never occurred to the industry itself. Surely the key point to appreciate is how that demand is created in the first place, along with consideration for the planning and investments that underpin it. Then there's the business expertise, the audience analytics, which together with the production and post-production skills for which the UK is, I think, rightly renowned, these will ensure the industry remains competitive and at the cutting edge of change well into the future. In almost every respect, there's a far greater choice for cinephiles today than at any time in history. As a young man, if I wanted to see a variety of films, I either went to the National Film Theatre or there were two or three connoisseur screens in and around London. That was it. You literally could identify on the fingers of one hand the number of, cine of cinema screens on which you could find non mainstream product. Media events this past summer, I think, have had the effect of reminding us that plurality of supply can only be a good thing. But theatrical releasing patterns in this country happily now accommodate to a whole galaxy of voices. Hollywood excels at making movies for the world, and interestingly, not just for its own citizens. Every passing year throws up new ways, legal and regrettably otherwise, for people to locate and consume movies. But more availability does not in itself help the public beat a path to the particular titles they're likely to enjoy. On the contrary, simply adding to the melee may well serve to confuse or even confound them. It, if I may, let me point, but to point at this point briefly, mourn the premature passing earlier this month of Steve Jobs, 